Lord around here, you're not going to be alone. Hallelujah. Where'd old brother running Charlie go? I don't see him. I got a feeling he might take a running fit or two tonight. He's way back yonder. Praise the Lord. I like what the little girl said singing last night. Charlie likes to worship God with an ab ab abandon. <laughs> God, who much is forgiven, they, they, we thank the Lord a little bit deeper level. So I hope that you will put your heart right at the feet of Jesus and worship him. I remember the witness when they first came to freedom many years ago. Uh, John and Jeff and Susan and the family has increased. Don't you look come here at this fine young man. And it's just a joy to have these folks back. They're our brothers and our sister in the Lord, and we appreciate the witness. Let them know you're going to be praying for them and worshiping with them as they sing and minister tonight. The witness, God bless you. joy I have found since I made Jesus my King. For He brought me out from death unto life, and He gave me a reason to sing. Savior who reigns above 
this life is true Will you be one of God's faithful few? I'm going to heaven, how about you? How about you? How about you? Tell me where you're headed when this life is true Will you be one of God's faithful few? I'm going to heaven, how about you? Friend, do you know the Savior? Have you been born again? Washed in the blood of Calvary's flood, free and forgiven with them. How about you? How about you? Tell me where you're headed when this life is through. Will you be one of God's faithful few? I'm going to heaven. How about you? It's time to get it set if you're not ready to go, you can be saved by grace today, but no doubt about your soul. How about you? How about you? Tell me where you're headed when this life is through. Will you be one of God's faithful few? I'm going to heaven. How about you? Will you be one of God's faithful howling winds and the storm the threatened in the disciples sailed a boat on Galilee they were tired and full of fright they had fought the storm all night but then the master he came walking on the sea be not afraid, for it is high in the fourth watch of the night. You fall and pray, but I am here, and it's alright. The storm will rage, the winds will blow, but they are under my control. It won't be long till morning breaks. Be not afraid. Seems gone, the day is done, and the night keeps pressing on. Doctors say that they've done all that they can do. Around the clock, the family prays, but help's already, it's already on the way. Without a doubt, another doctor is in the room. Be not afraid, for it is high In the fourth watch of the night You fall and pray, but I am here And it's alright The storm will rain, the winds will go But they are under my control But 
good news tonight somebody needed to hear that boy it's good to be in the house of the Lord it's good to feel his presence I'll be honest with you it's good to be anywhere there's people and folks that just want to worship Jesus this is about the fifth time that we have sung since March the 15th and we're just glad to be anywhere just to be honest with you and uh, I love this church, I always have. We were reminiscing, coming uh, on the property of singing in the old building. And uh, I just want you to know, Brother Mike, I love you and I appreciate you. You've been a blessing to us over the years. And we were one of our favorite preachers in all the world tonight. No greater friend. Southern Gospel's never had a greater friend than Dr. Ralph Sexton, Jr. And I love him and appreciate him. He's been a blessing to us. And uh, to a lot of other groups. And I'm, I'm anxious for what the Lord's going to do tonight. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking. I just want to say we're glad to be here tonight. And uh, we've not, the song we're getting ready to do, we've not done in a long time. But Susan, uh, I lean on her a lot when it comes to picking our songs. And laying out kind of at least a skeleton of a program. And she looked at me coming up here today. She said, I think we need to do this song tonight. The song was written many years ago by Ms. Kyla Rowland, and we've sung it for a lot of years, and we've kind of laid it aside, just as you have new songs come along, you, you lay other songs aside, but this message is so timely right now, because there's somebody underneath the sound of my voice tonight, you're worried, you're scared, you're confused, and I'll be honest with you, you're looking at one. My week's always spent getting ready to leave and go sing the next week. And it ain't happened for a long time. So it's way different. But I just want to, I just, <laughs> I just come here to remind you tonight. If you've been walking with the Lord any amount of time, the past is a promise that you're going to have all that you're ever going to need. next time when I need some mercy will grace be sufficient oh how will I know the next time my heart is broken will it be mended well Comfort Elijah was David a part of this promise to be? Did God's son rise out of Judah? Did he walk up Golgotha? The past holds the power of this promise to me will I just go back to the moment he saved me I just go back to every prayer that he
Well, I'm so glad to tell the story of a Savior came from glory, born in Bethlehem to live like me. Gave, gave me a sample of a perfect, perfect example of what true love really ought to be. I will glory in the story about a little bitty baby born in Bethlehem. I will glory in the story on a cross he would die so that I could live again. I'm a Bible believer, a salvation receiver, yeah. according to the riches of His grace. I'll lift up the banner with glory and honor, and tell about my Lord all over the place. I will glory in the story about a little bitty baby born in Bethlehem. I will glory in the story On a cross he would die so that I can live again It's not a legend or a mystery It's the greatest fact of history That Jesus is the truth, the life, the way Scholars have denied it Skeptics have tried it But he lived and he died and he's living still today I will glory in the story About a little bitty baby born in Bethlehem I will glory in the story On a cross he would die so that I could live again I will glory in the story yeah. About a little bitty baby born in Bethlehem I will glory in the story On a cross he would die so that I could live again Oh, a little bitty baby was born in death On a cross he would die so that I could live Glory in the story yeah. Well, I will glory in the story about a little bitty baby born in Bethlehem. Oh, I will glory in the story. On a cross he would die so that I could live again. Oh, a little bitty baby was born in Bethlehem. On a cross he would die so that I could live. Glory in the story.
all God's people said. Amen. Woo, amen. It's already been good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. amen. And he is a good, good father. Amen. Uh, just, just in the way of prayers for us, Austin has been married four years. This is our son, Austin. How many remember when these little boys just were little toeheads sitting on the front seat of the church? Austin and Ethan. Austin's going to be a daddy July the 14th if it doesn't come before. So it'll be our first little grandbaby. And Aaron's got one expecting and his second one in October. So we've got a lot of little babies. and. I'm not expecting. Hallelujah. <laughs> I want Ethan to sing a brand new song that, my goodness, every time I hear it, it just convicts me and reminds me of how good we've got it. If he woke us up this morning, we're blessed. Right. Yeah, we may be without a job. Yes, yeah, some of us are sick. Yes, yeah, some of us are trying to get our bills paid. We are not seeing it happen, but he woke us up this morning. He gave us air in our lungs. We've got much to be thankful for yes. tonight. And I'm going to say this. The world's watching us. Right. Easy to praise him when there's no coronavirus. When there's no problems. Even when the sun is shining. But sometimes it rains. Yeah. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. Right. It's going to rain. This song says, Lord, I'm going to praise you no matter what. I want you to listen to this brand new song. It seems my life is filled with storms and great despair. But Lord, it brings me comfort just to know you're there I know this storm will cease but till then I have your peace and regardless of what I go through I will keep my trust in you and I'll praise you when the sun is shining bright and things are going right I'll praise you when my life is full of rain and all I feel is pain. When all I see are broken dreams, Lord, I know you're all I need. I'll praise you. I'll praise you for you are God. Sometimes I love to stay out in the sunshine's glow, but I know it takes a little rain to help me grow. So rather than complain, when I feel it start to rain, I will choose to keep my eyes on you and know that you will see me through. And I'll praise you when the sun is shining bright and things are going right. I'll praise you when my life is full of rain and all I feel is pain. When all I see are broken dreams, Lord, I know you're all I need. I'll praise you, I'll praise you, for you are God. And Lord, you never said that life was easy. And oh, and Lord, you didn't promise I would never see a trial. But when my life is darkest, Lord, you can shine the brightest, and I know that you will walk with me each and every mile, and I'll praise you when the sun is shining bright and everything is going right. I'll 
sing one more song and then we'll let brother Ralph uh, cannot wait to hear the message that he's going to bring us we don't know what tomorrow holds none of us do I don't know what's coming about Friday I know we had a big I want to say mess on our uh, courthouse yard on Saturday and I'm going to be honest with you it scared me to death we've got a, a friend that's a police officer and it's a lady and I'm telling you I started praying a hedge of protection around her that God would protect her Mm, we need Psalms 91. We need us. We need a hedge of protection. Yes. I pray that around my family every day. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we do know who holds our tomorrow. Yes, Amen. And if it all falls apart today or tonight or tomorrow, can we say it's all right? Yes. Because all is well. Amen. Yes. To God be the glory. Great thing. <laughs> He have done. When the world is crashing in and you don't know what to do, you can call on God, He will see you through. Cause there is no way that we can lose Just knowing we can trust Him In all we say and do Strength will never fail, all is well, all is well. And so hold on to the promise that is forever true. You can cast your care on him because he cares for you in time and again he has proved that his grace is sufficient his mercy is ever
You honestly glad you come to church tonight? Holler amen. Y'all alive out there, ain't you? <laughs> it is well with my soul. Years ago, I was a student at Liberty University working at a little church in Brookneal, Virginia. The pastor and the folks told me, said, you're going to go sing tonight somewhere down Somewhere between Brookneal, Virginia, and Raleigh, North Carolina. I don't remember the town your daddy had the tent up in. But uh, first time I met your dad, that was 1972. And uh, only man ever had to sign my Bible. <laughs> uh, talking about those bees are swarming and getting in all that honey. <laughs> and when Dr. Harold B. Seiler was here years ago as my heart's desire to have Dr. Seidler and Ralph Sexton Sr. together. Well, that didn't quite work out because that was the time your dad was really sick. And he tried to be here. He told me to be here. Then, of course, he got real sick. And, but I've never met you, brother, but I met you tonight, and you are my brother. So here at Freedom, it's an honor to have you. So here in God's house, before God's people, coming with God's message from God's word, under God's anointing, by God's grace, in God's name, is God's man, Brother Ralph Sexton, Jr. Make him welcome, please. Come here, man. Hey, Pastor. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. and. I know that uh, Pop wanted to come, mm -hmm. and uh, he lost his health and wasn't able to do that. And uh, little honey for the journey yeah. was that message he was preaching under the tent. Yeah. And uh, he and Dr. Seitler and uh, a whole generation there of men loved the Lord, Absolutely. loved his word. Absolutely. And uh, one thing they had in common is they loved the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they believed that God's timepiece was the nation of Israel. And I was in Israel when the COVID outbreak uh, started. And uh, there's something going on in our government that we can't explain. Uh, but we do know that the nation of Israel has picked up on the fact that we're at a crisis moment and God controls the affairs of men. And they feel like that uh, Cyrus uh, allowed the children of Israel to come back into Jerusalem to build the, the temple after 70 years of bondage. Mm -hmm. And they went back into Jerusalem and to the land of Israel in 1948. Mm -hmm. And now they saw that uh, when our president came and made the declaration that the embassy would be moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, that that was another 70-year period. Yeah. And they said, it's time. And they believe that the Messiah is coming. Hey. They're more excited about the Lord's return than any Baptist I've ever met. Now, you think about that. And, Pastor, I wanted to give you this from the... Temple Institute that's building and they started the process mm. and I want to read to you the proclamation and I'll give this to you. To express joy and gratitude to President Donald Trump for moving the American Embassy to Jerusalem, the Great Seal of America was minted on the coin next to the President of the United States. President Trump is advancing the prophetic process that will usher in the rebuilding of the third temple. And it is following in the footsteps of King Cyrus. After 70 years, uh, the Lord of the world charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. And so, Pastor, on behalf of our ministry and your love all these years and support uh, for God's people, we want to present you one from the Temple Treasures Institute there, and there's King Cyrus, mm -hmm. and there's Donald Trump, and there is the scripture from Isaiah 
that we love and salute you tonight. And God bless you. And uh, this is a uh, 100% cashmere, and you can see it's made there in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And we want you to know that you're very special and that we honor and salute you. Maybe that's why the devil's a fighting so hard all over American world. He knows he ain't got much time. But he's defeated and we got victory. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Dr. Well, you. we're just honored that we can share that with you. And a lot of Americans don't know uh, what's happening and how fast it's happening. And uh, so uh, they have allowed us to bring some of those uh, into the United States. And uh, I think Colby, there's some back there. And uh, ladies, the Christians uh, in the Christian Arabs in Bethlehem and Bethany, those ladies are the ones that make those beautiful scarves there in Jerusalem. And they're going through the same thing the Wisnets were talking about, being off the road. Well, they haven't had any tourists come to their shops since March. So they put a bunch of those scarves in a suitcase, sent them to us, and they said if you would just give a donation that they'll be back there after the service. What uh, There's some back there, and if you just want to give a donation, there's some envelopes that say the Israel Fund, and you can just put them in there, donation, and we'll send it to, to those families. A lot of you that follow our ministry know that we have an Israel fund. Uh, people always wondering how can I help the nation of Israel. And uh, a lot of you have given in the past. Uh, we've bought a beautiful ambulance and presented it to the nation of Israel. And all right on the door, it says, Your Christian Friends in the USA. Right. And uh, they allowed us to come up to the Knesset. That's their Washington, D.C., that's their Congress. And we presented them the keys to the nation of Israel. And that drives through Jerusalem every day. And on the door, it says, Your Christian Friends from the USA. And then the, the traffic's gotten so heavy that the ambulances can't get through quickly. They get bogged down. So we bought a medical motorcycle. And it's a, a fancy motorcycle with a crash cart on the back. And so it can go on the sidewalk, it can go through yards, go up the side of the road and it gets to the people that's having a heart attack or whatever, and uh, they go through there, and so we bought one of those, and it's down on the coast uh, in the community of Natanya, and it works there near Tel Aviv. And then a lot of you know my precious wife just passed away, and uh, after 52 years of marriage, and uh, so we wanted to do something to honor her life. And tomorrow's our wedding anniversary. What about that? And uh, so uh, we wanted to do something a little special. So they have a yellow ambulance. If you ever see the news sometimes, you'll see them in Israel. And those are mobile intensive care units. And they can do blood transfusions and field operations and deliver babies. And uh, so in March, we presented them the keys to a yellow mobile intensive care unit, and it's got uh, my wife's name on the side. It says, in memory of Musette Sexton and her Christian friends in the United States. Amen. Amen. We want to make sure that witness gets on all that equipment, Amen. that it's God's people, that we're praying for them. Always remember, God doesn't tell time with a Rolex or a Timex. He tells time with the nation of Israel. And when God deals with Israel, you might all start packing your bags. We're about out of here. Amen. So this could be the day. This COVID's no accident. It's, all this is happening. We went from the world's greatest economy to uh, millions of people unemployed and out of work and all of that. Uh, I brought a message. Well, I got one right here. When God puts America in timeout, what happens when the nation is placed in a timeout? God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. It's not an accident. And pastor, for you trying to love on the people and encourage the people, it's an important time. We need our faith more than ever. And 
Someone said, well, Brother Ralph, didn't they close the churches? Why, no, you can't close a church. We're open 24-7. You are the church. It's not a building. Amen. Uh, you are the church. You, you can't close us. We are the church. And so uh, we've had to call off services and be inconvenienced, but that's to keep you alive, bless God, so we can fight another day. Amen. So, uh, but you just be encouraged tonight. Don't be discouraged. Uh, some had called today wanting to know on Bible prophecy, and some had called about being able to be in the service tonight, and they have changed everything in their county today. A lot of East Tennessee, I'll tell you more about that at the end of the service. They got a lot of uh, uh, rapid changing events, and people that were planning to come, even some churches, uh, and they had to change their plans uh, even this afternoon. But here's what is happening, ladies and gentlemen. God has got the church at an intersection that we need to realize that it doesn't matter what kind of car you got in the parking lot. It doesn't matter how many bedrooms you got at the house. It doesn't matter how many stocks and bonds you have or how many acres of land you own. Right. What matters are you ready to meet the Lord? Because this thing is winding down and we need to be ready for the coming of the Lord. And I want you to take your Bible, turn with me to Matthew 28. And I want to read to you a verse or two in just a moment. But you say, well, Brother Ralph, where are we? I want to answer that question I got today because some uh, wanted to know uh, where are we prophetically. And I'll answer that, and then I'll get to this message. Uh, if I had to answer in prophecy, I love studying Bible prophecy. Yeah. Bible prophecy does two or three things for you. I've been begging pastor for years, let me come up here and take two or three nights, tell you how close we are to coming to the Lord. Thank God I finally got up here, amen. So I'm trying to fill my dad's boots, amen, here we go. But number one, if you believe the Lord's coming, number one, you want to be right with God. If you believe the Lord's coming and he could come tonight, you want to be right with each other. Number three, if you believe the Lord's coming and he could come tonight, you don't want to leave anybody you love behind. It'll make you a soul winner, and it'll make you a prayer warrior. And you need to know, if we open our Bible, where are we prophetically? Well, we're in the book of Jude. That's where the church is tonight. We're in the book of Jude right before the revelation of the Antichrist. You say, well, Pastor Ralph, do you believe it's that close? Well, I'm going to start right here with this uh, fern, and I'm going to let this be Genesis chapter 1. And I'm going to walk to that other fern, and that's going to be Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter 1, I've got the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 2, I've got the creation in animation. In Genesis chapter 3, I've got Adam and Eve in the garden, and I've got the fall. Genesis chapter 4, I've got Cain and Abel. In Genesis chapter 5, I've got the sons of that we find of Adam and of Eve and the history, the lineage that's there. Genesis chapter 6, I see that Noah has found grace, verse 8, in the eyes of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 7, I see and recognize the ark and the construction and what's going to be taking place. In Genesis chapter 9, I see that there's going to be a covenant made and a rainbow in the sky. In Genesis chapter number 10, I see that we have the sons of Noah. In Genesis chapter 11, oh, something changes, Bible students. Always pay attention. This is the chapter of chaos. This is the chapter of confusion. That number 11 changed everything. You see the number 12 in Bible prophecy. That's that next chapter. Here it is. That's human government, 12 tribes of Israel. This is the birth of the nation of Israel. Abram's called out of the Ur of Chaldees in chapter number 12. But in chapter 11, we've got the languages being scattered. we got confusion. And we've got man so prideful, he's going to build a tower to God. And God said, no, works won't get you to heaven. Only grace will get you to heaven. And God brought all of that tumbling down. 
But remember what happened in 11. 11 is the number of chaos. The 11 is the number of confusion. And could I just take a little sidestep and remind you of current history that God tried to shake our church and wake us up that we would see we're on this last walk into the coming of the Lord? It happened on a day in September. Does anybody remember the day? Nine what? Nine one one nine eleven right? And that's that was that a day of confusion? Was it a day of chaos? Has America ever been the same since that day? Did we start losing our freedoms that day? Did we start losing liberty that day? Yes, we did. And did anybody ever see what those big towers look like if you were in New Jersey looking across into New York? Those big towers, did they make a number on the skyline? A big giant 11. That's exactly right. And guess where those towers were located? They're located in New York City, 11 letters. And they're in New York State, the 11th state to come into the Union. And the men that flew those planes into the tower, they were born in Saudi Arabia, 11 letters. And the plot to bring down the towers was hatched in Afghanistan, 11 letters. Oh, by the way, the very first flight that flew into those towers was flight number 11. That's right, United Flight number 11. That was the first plane into the towers. And how many people did it have on board? 65. 6 plus 5 is 11. You see, God actually loved America enough to let you know you have now entered into the chaos and confusion. Has there been any chaos in America the last few weeks? Has there been any confusion? God's got a hold of the church going, hey, wake wake up, wake up, wake up. He doesn't say that we'll be asleep when he comes. He says the world will be asleep. He said when he comes, the world will will realize that as a thief in the night. But not to the Bible believer, not to the Christian. What did he say for us? He said, watch and be ready. He said, glory to God. He likes it when we even say get ready because he wants the church to be alert and to be awakened. And church, you cannot go to sleep on these last few days before the Lord comes. You've got to stay close. You've got to pray. You've got to sing. You've got to shout. You've got to live in the victory. And we can't live in retreat. And from Genesis 1 all the way up to Genesis 12, that's 2,000 years of time. Now, if this now becomes what? Genesis 12, and I walk up, Now I'm going to walk through here and I'm going to go through the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and I come right on up in here into the New Testament and now I'm at Acts chapter 2. Genesis 12 to Acts 2, 2,000 years. What about that? And then if I start here in Acts chapter 2 and I walk up through here and I go up here, what's that? Oh, that's freedom. Tabernacle right there. Look. Right there. That's right before the day he comes back. Do you see? And that's another 2,000 years. What does the Bible say? A day with the Lord is what? As a thousand years and a thousand years as a, as a day. And how many thousand years did I just have? I had here 1 to 12, 2,000, 12 to Acts 2, 2,000, Acts 2, till tonight, 2,000. Two, four, six days. Huh? Six days. And then on the seventh day, what did he do? And what's on the other side of this? The millennial reign of Christ. Glory to God. Do you see how close we are? We're living in that moment. And while I was in Israel a few weeks ago, do you know what they told us? We were down at the Dead Sea and I was doing a study and a teaching down at the Dead Sea Scrolls proven by the way that your King James Bible is the inerrant, infallible, holy, inspired Word of God. God preserved it, wrapped it up in sheepskin, had it down there in that desert so it would never be destroyed and be a living proof that God had the power to preserve His Word for thousands of years. And that's exactly what He did. That we'd have it tonight. 
And you know what they told us while we were down there? They said they just discovered there's enough potash in the Dead Sea, fertilizer, to fertilize every farm, every garden, on every continent in the world for 1,000 years. What? Oh, yeah, because we're going to have a 1,000 years to rule and reign with him. And you're going to grow big tomatoes and greasy cut short beans. And you got to have some fertilizer for your garden because he's going to let a silver queen corn really do good over that next thousand years. Do you understand? We're living in the middle of this. And God don't want you to be in defeat. He don't want you to be discouraged. And he didn't want you to be distressed. Well, that brings me to my text verse, Matthew 28, verse number 6. Because if I'm in the book of Jude tonight, right before the revelation of the Antichrist, the lying, deceiving Antichrist, then what am I walking through? I'm walking through the valley of the virus. That's where I am. The virus is changing the world. And the virus has got this whole world in a spirit of fear and anxiety. And what we're doing is we're walking through the virus. We're walking through that valley. Do you notice in uh, Psalms 23, verse number 4, he said, Yea, though I stay in the valley. Yea, though I camp out in the valley. Yea, though I build a temple in the valley. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley. We didn't come to stay. Bless God, we're going to the house. But on the way to the house, you may have to go through the valley of the virus. Now, the, what makes the difference is what happens here in verse 2 of Matthew 28. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning. Isn't that something? And it says that his raiment was white as snow. And then notice what happens here. And for the fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as what? Dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear ye not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was what? Crucified. And here's our text verse. He is not here. For he is risen, as he said, come see the place that the Lord lay. Don't you like that? Come see the place. Out of all the religions in the world, you are the only religion where your founder is alive and well. Think about that. The only one. Uh, When you begin to read about what God's doing, and you begin to read about what the virus has done, and we see the, the America paralyzed, we see the city shut down, we see the economy, uh, cruise ships have been docked since March, airplanes are parked out in the desert. They say it may take 10 years to get air travel back up to where it used to be. And in the first four weeks of the COVID crisis of America, we had 22 million people unemployed in four weeks. We're now over 40 million people unemployed. It's been unbelievable. And we're seeing that this valley of the virus has a devastating impact. And I got to thinking about, have I ever seen anything with this much impact in my life? And the answer is obviously no. I've never seen anything like this. But I have seen an influence of death that was powerful. I was traveling with my dad. We were with Dr. Billy Kanoi, and we had been in Israel, and we decided that we would go down and uh, drive uh, in a a bus, go down, and we'd cross the Suez Canal, and we would go into Egypt. And so we were going down there to study and to, to work on scriptures and stuff, and we were talking along the way. And as we were going... Uh, we got outside of Cairo, Egypt, and all of a sudden, I saw uh, to the right of the bus and to the left of the bus, I saw uh, little houses and buildings. Some of them were not much taller than this uh, soundboard here. 
and yet it was uh, a little house and it and it was beautifully painted and decorated and then uh, on the outside of the bus along the side of the road there were people living in cardboard boxes and uh, 50 gallon drums cut in half and uh, people had taken thorns from the uh, desert and they'd stretched uh, animal hides over them and that was their home but right on the other side of this fence was acre after acre after acre of little houses and buildings and some of them multi-story and beautifully painted and manicured and I, I'm and after four or five miles of that I said to the guy I said what on earth is this people are living in poverty and all these empty buildings on the ins, on the outside of the roadway and she said oh dr sexton said that's the city of the dead said it's 25 square miles of empty buildings she said if their loved one dies they have to build a house for their spirit and said they'll live on the side of the road to get enough cinder block and concrete to build a house for the spirit of their mother or their grandfather and said but they're living in fear and they're living in poverty and yet all this beautiful stuff is empty on both sides of the road and I got to thinking about how the devil's a liar and how the devil doesn't play fair and if somebody just stop on the side of the road and say he's alive and they are in eternity and you don't have to build them a house because they're not going to live in it to be absent from the body you're going to be in the presence of God or you're going to be in the presence of someone else and you need to know what the word of God teaches and so when I began to think about what was taking place and I thought about that cities of the dead we face a virus right now and think about what happened to us the Chinese got so angry at our president because uh, uh, he was not being buffaloed with their military and he put on the trade deal they said he's got the big economy he's going to get elected again we've got to do something and the Wuhan virus was left out and here's what's frightening ladies and gentlemen if this is the city of Wuhan and the, their biological lab is there, when that got out and the people started dying all around it, they went out and put a corridor around the province and they kept all it from going to their people. But in the middle here is the international airport. They kept that open and they let that virus fly around the world so that the whole world would taste and in December, January, and February, over 400,000 Chinese flew to America in those three critical months and took it to New York and took it to L.A. And, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my humble opinion, it was an act of war. It killed Americans. And, and, you know, it's unbelievable what happened and what we're living through today. You think about it now, the suffering, and, the, and we've got churches and friends that are going through unbelievable things. And if you go and look at this and study it, you'll see that in New York City, they dug mass graves. They couldn't even keep up with them. And Italy, they dug mass graves. I don't know if you saw some of the peop, uh, pictures last week out of Brazil, but they were just as far as you could see on the horizon, just grave after grave after grave after grave all because of one germ that you can't see. And you know what I got to thinking about? If there's a city of the dead and people are building a, a false hope and a false home, then, ladies and gentlemen, if a virus can bring a, the world to its knees, what would happen if God were willing to show his wrath? Yeah. You know what it made me want to make sure? Makes me make sure I'm going to go to heaven because if it's this bad today... What would it be when the Holy Spirit draws off and the tribulation comes and the spirit of evil rules this world? If it's this scary now, what could it be when the people of faith 
are gone. And when the judgment of a holy God begins, it ought to cause us to want to serve him like never before. It ought to cause us to be broken before God like never before. And that we ought to say, I'm going to be faithful to the word of God. I'm going to be faithful to the house of God. I'm going to be faithful to sing the word of God. And I'm going to be faithful to tell my family and my friends that it's not the material things of this world that matter. But the only thing that matters is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ. You think about that. If you go to this empty tomb that we talked about in Jerusalem, there's some few steps, little stone steps that go down and goes right down to that beautiful little garden. And it's not like that way at every tomb. You know, if, if you go to William Shakespeare's tomb and, and, and you'll go to his at Stratford-on-Avon, you'll see there is a description. Here lies the dust of that genius writer. If you go over and uh, to the Middle East and you go to Muhammad's tomb and you'll see it adorned with diamonds and you'll see that inside there it are the bones of Muhammad. And if you go to Mount Vernon and you go to the tomb of our first president, George Washington, you'll see inside there are the bones of our founding father. And if you journey to Paris and stand before that magnificent sarcophagus there and with glit and gold, and inside there will be the body of the little general. That will be the body of Napoleon Bonaparte. And it's his remains. Go to Westminster Abbey there in London, England, and you'll go and you'll find the grave of Queen Victoria, and you'll see the grave of Robert Burns, and you'll see the tomb there of that great missionary, David Livingston. His remains are there. But you know what? Those people in Africa that loved him, that he took the gospel to before they sent his body back to England, they opened his chest, and they took his heart out, and they buried his heart in Africa, and they sent the old clay tabernacle back to London because he had a love for God and a love for people. And when you get to these tombs, all you're going to find is where someone used to be alive, and you'll see the dust of a decaying body, or you'll see, my friend, the bones that are left there in that grave. But what you need to remember me uh, with me tonight is the fact that if you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you love him and you go to Jerusalem, it's not like if you go to Buddha's grave, what are you going to find? You're going to find Buddha bones. But it's not that way. When you walk down those steps in Jerusalem and you go up there, there's just a little old sign on the door. It's not very big at all, about the size of my Bible. And it just says, He is not here. Amen. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Hey, there's no grave like that anywhere in the world. It's the grave of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to be afraid of death. We may be walking through the valley of the virus, but we don't have to be afraid as we walk through the valley. We don't have to chew our fingernails off to the elbow. We are living in the land of the free, the home of the brave, and if you've been born again, you've got the comfort of the inerrant, infallible, holy, inspired Word of God. There's nothing like it anywhere else. I thought about a friend of mine in my church, and I got a phone call one day, and his precious wife said, could you come to our house? And I went. And uh, Maria greeted me at the door, and she said, Pastor Ralph, can you come in? I need to talk to you. And I said, sure, sure. Her husband's one of our deacons. She said, I found out today that I've got cancer. Said, I've been in a battle for several years, but I haven't told anyone and said, uh, but I found out today when I went to the medical center that I, I can't receive any more treatment or help. And looks like I'm going to go home to be with the Lord. 
And I, I couldn't believe it. You know how it just sort of takes your breath. I said, well, we'll pray. We'll believe the Lord. And so her husband, so precious, he called me about two weeks later and he said, Brother Ralph said, they, they've got an experimental drug at Duke and said, I, I twist Marie's arm. She wants to go to heaven so bad she can taste it. And I said, you ain't taking off and leaving me. Said, uh, we're going to go to Duke. And said, I want you to pray that they'll be able to help her. And so they took off. They went to Duke. And two days later, my phone rang, and it was Mission Hospital. And uh, they had a son named Billy. He's 10 years old. And uh, it was Billy's older brother. And uh, I could hear all this noise in the background. You know how you can hear the background noise. And then I could hear this little painful cry. It's just crying out in horrible, horrible pain. And he said, Pastor Ralph, he said, can you come to Mission Hospital? He said, it's Billy. He's really sick. And I knew his mom and daddy were at Duke. And here's little Billy, 10 years old, and he's critically ill. And I got to the hospital, and when I got to the emergency room, I could hear that child crying out in the emergency room with pain. And I got back there, and they had him on a papoose board trying to hold him from the pain that they were trying to get an IV and everything into it. And the doctor walked out and he said, are you Billy's pastor? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, pastor, I've got some terrible news I need to share with you. He said, Billy's got a brain tumor about the size of an orange. I said, what? I said, his mama's at Duke getting experimental treatment. He said, I know, I just found that out. He said, the only chance this boy's got to live, I'm going to put him on a helicopter and I'm going to fly him to Duke. I said, you're going to fly that kid on a helicopter to Duke where his mama is. And he said, I have no choice. It's such a complicated surgery. We might can buy him some days, but we can't do it here. And so, sure enough, they put that little boy on an air flight and got his mama out of the treatment center she was in, put her in a wheelchair, and rolled her down to the helicopter pad to meet her little boy as he came out. He went into emergency surgery, and God was merciful, and they gave him some months to live that he could be with his family. And you know what happened? We got everybody back home, and about uh, a month later, I guess it was, Marie called and said, Billy's having a, a bad day. Can you come out? And I said, absolutely. And I went out and I said, Billy, what do you want to do, buddy? And he said, will you play trucks with me? And I said, absolutely. So we got in the floor and he had these little remote control motorized trucks and we were playing trucks. And he was driving his and he'd climb up and jump and we were just having a big time. And he said, have you heard the good news, Pastor? Ten. I said, no, Billy, what's the good news? He said, I'm going to heaven. I said, you are? He said, yeah. He said, Mom and I have been talking about it. Said, every night we lay in the bed. Mama's going too. Said, but, but we just talk about it. Said, do you know what, Pastor? Do you know anything about heaven? I said, well, I, I know a little bit, but I probably don't know what you and Mama know. And he said, no, it's better than Disney World. <laughs> I said, you mean it's better than Disney World? He said, it's better than Disney World. He said, he said the streets are made of gold and everybody's happy and nobody's sick and we all get to see Jesus. He said, I don't know about you, but I can't wait. <laughs> you know what? Ten years old. I went home. Two days later, Marie called. They said, can you come to the house? And I went to the house. Marie was laying in the bed, and Billy was right here in the crook of her arm, had his head laying on his mama. And uh, I walked in, and I saw him laying there, and I said, hey, oh, and I said, oh, I'm sorry, Marie. I didn't see he was asleep. She said, honey, he's not asleep. He's in heaven. Oh, my I said, what? She said, I was reading him a story, and I was telling him about Jesus. 
I was telling them about the goodness of God. Yeah. I was telling them about how real it is and said, I was stroking his hair and said he just dozed off to sleep and said, that little rascal said we both fell asleep and when I woke up, angels had picked him up and took him to heaven and said, I just want you to know, Brother Ralph, it's real. God's real. We may have to walk through the valley, but we won't walk alone. Three weeks later, her husband called me and said, Pastor, can you come back to the house? I said, sure. And I got the house. Marie was laying in the bed. They'd moved the bed in the living room so she could be with everybody. And I walked in there. And he was standing over. His tears were dripping on her face. And she said, honey, you're raining on me. And he said, I can't help it. And she said, Pastor, would you tell him to quit crying? I'm going to heaven. <laughs> said, have you heard about it? <laughs> I said, you and Billy are wearing me out. I can tell you that much. And she said, it's so beautiful. Said, I got a little glimpse a little while ago. Said, I thought I was almost in there. Said, I could hear him singing. And I thought I was almost in there. And said, he kept saying, don't leave me. And said, he keeps bringing me back. <laughs> said, would you talk to him, Pastor? And I, I went over and I put my arm around him and I prayed. And you know, in a matter of a few minutes, she took that last sweet breath of air. And the next breath, was healed for time and for eternity. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that's not a fairy tale. That's not Steven Spielberg. That's not Hollywood Presents. It's the inerrant, infallible, holy inspired Word of God. That when you're in the valley of the virus, you don't have to be afraid. And you don't have to live in fear. You can trust the Lamb of God and you can believe His holy Word. It's real. And it's the word that we're going to live by and walk by in this day and hour that we're in. I want to share something else with you before I close. And I want to tell you, I mentioned that tomorrow is my wife and I's anniversary. And uh, we fell in love the first time she saw me. And I remember when she asked me to marry her, I told her, uh, I can say all that stuff now, she's in heaven. <laughs> but we did, we fell in love as teenagers and we were in college together. She was a year ahead of me in college and we fell in love and I remember the first time I saw her, she had on a mint green skirt and a woolly sweater and had on bass Weegian shoes and I thought, she's pretty as a picture. And I'm going to ask her out. And a guy beside me said, you can't. She's going steady with one of those upperclassmen. And she's wearing his ring. I said, I ain't never stopped me in the past. I don't believe it'll stop me now. <laughs> Long story short, we started dating. And we fell in love. I had a little 57 Chevrolet convertible, baby blue. 283 block, bored out to 301, ported and polished. Had a hearse mystery shifter, and I had a three-quarter racing cam, and had racing slicks and baby moons, and it was bad to the bone. <laughs> I had chrome headers, and I had a chrome dipstick. You checked your oil, you didn't want to put any pollution in there, so <laughs> it did everything but pay the gas bill. You burn a half a tank of gas between the house and the school. Had to put a new clutch in that thing every six weeks because <laughs> I left part of the tires on the roadway going up to the school. I was known and loved by all the highway patrolmen in our area. <laughs> it got so bad that Mr. McDevitt with the city police, he... He wouldn't chase me anymore. He would just go in the house and cut his lights off and wait in the driveway. 
That ain't really fair, is it? <laughs> and uh, we go out on a date. You know, fellas, you remember how that worked. You'd get right almost to her house and you'd pull over the side of the road and open the trunk and get out some polished cloths and you'd wipe the dust off those baby moons and make sure there's no dust on the dash and a little polish right up on the nose of that 57. And then you get to the house, you know, and you'd knock on the door and bring her out and you'd say, darling, you watch your step now. Don't twist that pretty little ankle. Just come, you know, you get her to the car, open the door and let her in. Close the door, run right around, sit down and look over and say, Hey, baby, where do you want to go tonight? And she said, oh, anywhere. Anywhere's fine. And I said, you want to go to the moon? I'm your rocket man. Here we go. <laughs> Don't laugh. You had some corny lines, too. I've heard a few. <laughs> oh, Lord. It's a wonder where any of us alive, isn't it? God was good to us. Then you get married a few years and something happens, you know. It's not, if you're not careful, you lose that love and romance. You get two or three young'uns and that same pretty little ankle's going up the sidewalk. It's got one holding on to the back of her dress. She's got 10 pounds of potatoes and five <laughs> gallons of milk, two bags of groceries going up the sidewalk. And, you're up on the porch saying, come on, old woman, I ain't waiting on you all day. <laughs> Something happened uh, along the journey. It's called losing your first love. Took it for granted. Took it for granted. March, April, and May, we started missing that first love. We couldn't be at church. We didn't have anybody hold our hand. Amen. We started thinking, boy, I wish I was back over there singing the choir again. If, I wish I could just sit on the back row and let them praise God around me one more time. Huh? Yes. We started losing that first love. And you don't know what it means, ladies and gentlemen, in this valley of the virus, unless we have that love for the Lord Jesus Christ yes. afresh and anew. This isn't the time to go cold and careless. It isn't the time to say we'll do something else some other time. This is the day. This is the hour right before he comes back that we ought to be saying, Lord, I want you more than anything else. Give me back my tears. Give me back my burden. God, give revival. God, please, I don't want my grandchildren to miss heaven. I don't want my children to miss heaven. I don't want people I love to go through the great tribulation. Oh, God, give us one more revival. Yeah. Give us one more time. Yeah. Give us one more chance to have that revival of love Amen. among God's people. You say, Pastor Ralph, is it real? It is. Yeah, it's real. Yeah, real, real. Yeah. You mentioned my dad a moment ago. And he went on to heaven. I preached his funeral. You mentioned people you love. My mother, she had Alzheimer's. I remember the first time I walked in the nursing home and sitting back there with her and she's eating and that fork got halfway to her mouth. And I said, what's wrong, Mama? And she just looked at that fork and looked at me she had forgotten how to eat just that quick. The rest of her life, that little lady that fed me, I fed her. Yeah, huh? Yeah. Serving Jesus is all that matters. Come on. This life's too short. Too short. We had nine, ten groups there at the church singing during this Southern Gospel. And you know the night you sang that song, Ethan, that night? We heard from England and Germany and France. And you know what happened? 
all across this country the words of that simple song that people are broken hearted they, they need that comfort they need that help because everything they trusted is gone the government couldn't help me my money couldn't help me my car couldn't help me my popularity couldn't help me is God real is he there in the time when I'm in the valley of the virus yes he is he's real and he's available for you and for me That same sweet girl that I fell in love with got sick in the last 10 years of her life. She was uh, so sick. She actually had two lives, 25 years of health and happiness and kids and 25 years of sickness. In the last 10 years, very sick, couldn't go to birthday parties and couldn't go to church. And the last two years of her life, she was bed fast and I'd have to cook and care for her and do her meds and try to pastor and try to go to church and preach and act like nothing's wrong when your heart's breaking. And I came in one night from preaching. She had that little hand up. She was praising God on that sick bed. I said, what's, what's going on? She said, I don't know if God's going to heal me or not. But said, if not, it's still all right. I said, what are you talking about? You know you're going to get better. She said, well, I don't know. But she said, God is and all is well. I said, what? She said, God is. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. He is my refuge. He is my, my solace when my heart's breaking. She said, God is and all is well. And Kobe, she went down and down. And you remember the morning she was so bad at the hospital and you boys were in the yard. They didn't know the news we'd got during the night. And those boys, they were there helping me. And they got under the kitchen window and sang to me. You remember what you sang? What? Because he lives. I can what? I can face tomorrow. And we were having to go face something that day. We got there to the hospital. And she had died three times the night before. And they brought her back. The doctor said she's probably got damage that if she came back she wouldn't know you, you know, because she had had full cardiac arrest three times. He said, but I tell you what, he said, we'll find out with your permission. And they took away some of the medicine, started bringing her up. And I'm standing right at the doorway and he's there with a couple of nurses and he said, Mrs. Sexton, she's on a ventilator now because she's been brought back three times. He said, Mrs. Sexton, can you hear me? And I looked over and she went, she nodded her head. He said, oh, that's good. She hears and she understands. He said, that's a miracle. That's amazing. He said, Miss Sexton, can you move your hand? wiggle your fingers and she wiggled her fingers he said I can't believe that he said I don't think I've ever seen anybody that's had that kind of trauma he said can you move your leg I saw the end of that sheet move a little bit he said do you understand you're on a ventilator she nodded her head and I walk, he said, do you want to talk to her? I said, does Jesus wear sandals? You know I do. I got her up right next to the bed, and I said, baby, I got her hand. I said, the whole family's here. Ever, all her children, all her grandchildren, church friends, all the associate pastors, everybody loved her, you know, they could get it. We're all in there. 
I said, do you know how sick you've been? I said, is there anything you want at all, darling? And she went. She pointed to that tray. She said, I said, oh, no. No. I said, that's keeping you alive. She went. I said, baby. I said, no. I said, you've, you've had cardiac arrest three times. We don't know if your lungs are strong enough. That ventilator is keeping you alive. I said, I said, you may not be able to live on your own. And uh, she squeezed my hand and she went. I said, oh, baby. I said, I love you and I can't. And she did like that. And I got close and she tried to kiss me. I said, are you serious? She said. <laughs> she said, I'm a winner either way. <laughs> she said, if it don't work, I'm going to happen. She motioned to pull that vent. In a little while, they pulled that vent out. And she smiled. And then... I love to hear her snore. She'd snore like a kitten, you know, just, just so easy. The next minute I heard her shift gears, and she just relaxed. All that equipment's gone, everything. She began to snore. And I turned around, and the angels just picked her up. And she went right to heaven. And the last thing she told me, that's pretty good preaching. God's real. We may be in the valley of the virus, but we're not alone. And this isn't just something that works in Sunday school in a class. It's not just something in a song. It's not just something the pastor says. It's a book we can live by, and if we have to, we can die by it's a word of God. You be encouraged tonight. You be a person of faith. And if God's speaking to you, you may want to come to this altar tonight. You may have a burden on your heart. You may have somebody you're praying for. You may have a situation in your life that you can't fix. But we know the God that can fix it. You just be tender hearted to him. Let's stand and bow our heads You just come if you want to pray for someone. Maybe you're not sure you're saved. This would be the great night of salvation. Maybe you need to come tonight. You've wandered away and gotten cold and careless. You come. This could be the time. This could be the day. Maybe God's wanting you to pray for you.